Hey, revolutionaries, I have a fun one for you this week. That's right, a fun one because I'm talking with Jeff Harry, and we're talking about how to rediscover your play. Yeah, play, your play, how to play. (laughs) Remember how to play? Oh, my gosh. Um, This episode was so great. It spoke to me on many different levels. So, you know, kind of the professional level of, I remember, you know, when I got out of school, so into technology and uh, my first job, I was in an advanced engineering group. And what's so funny, thinking back about it, is when when we would walk around the corporation or people would talk and refer to our group, they would talk to us about, or they would refer to us as, oh, those guys that play in the sandbox. All they do is play in the lab all day. And um, it was true. That's how I felt. I mean, I I was so interested in learning about technology. I was in the lab and I was trying to, you know, invent stuff. That was my job. And so... It was really like they, you know, the environment was there to foster your playfulness in terms of learning about technology, exploring, discovering, doing experiments, etc. And, you know, so I was really happy with my job. And there was a lot of other people, I think, in the corporations that, you know, uh, maybe had more responsibility or didn't have those type of direct creative jobs. And they've, you know, felt more, um, I'm sure, more structured and stressed out than I did, at least my first few years there. So... It just was a great reminder of like, yeah, I was, you know, that's when you're playing, it can really unleash your creativity and innovation. So that's the interesting thing about it. And this cuts across kind of all ways and informs also uh, or enables you to be open to reinvention as well, right? Because if you're in this creative state and you're innovating and you might just decide like, hey, well, why don't I just, you know, reinvent what I'm doing with my whole life or with my career or with my relationship. So it's pretty interesting. And, you know, we got, we, man, we went kind of super deep on the, uh, in this play concept. And, and Jeff even got a little bit uh, real with everybody um, sharing some, uh, one of his experiences as a, as a young person, because I asked him like, what, how do, why, why do people lose their play? How, how, how does that get shut down sometimes in people's lives? And so he, you know, sh- shared a real stressful experience of, of his when he was, uh, you know, kind of a teen uh, during your teenage years, you have to listen to the episode to check it out. But it was like, oh, right, I see. But you know, he made the decision to not shut himself down, not shut down his playfulness, and I think it really solidified um, his view of the world, kind of going forward. And so he's like, nope, I'm going to hold on to this and and share it with the world. Basically, his his passion for play. So really cool thing that came out of his experience, but. Before we get there, you know, before I, I got connected with Jeff and over the summer, I just wanted to mention this because it's kind of funny to me now. Maybe it was like a, a for, some foreshadowing for, for uh, getting connected with Jeff in this episode. And that, you know, over the summer, I was working out a lot outside because I had stopped going to the gym, you know, because it's, uh, it's COVID time. So got to change up what we're doing. And so I was going to the local high school track around me. And just running around the track and coming up with exercises and fun things to do. I'd run the steps of the stadium steps, which was kind of cool. Felt like Rocky or something, you know. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a better workout, too, in terms of just your your glutes and your uh, thighs, etc. It's kind of good for skiing and, you know, whatever kind of outdoor sports versus just running, you know, on flat on the the track. Anyways, (laughs) a little aside there. But while I was uh, at the track one day, I was there with a friend of mine. And I don't know what got into me, but I thought, you know what? I was just feeling better and I was more in shape and I was kind of getting that sort of childlike, you know, fun factor back in my life, you know, because it's super fun just being outside. So I thought, you know what? I haven't done a somersault in ages. Like it probably been 15 years probably, right? Because it's like, who just goes out and does somersaults all the time if you're not a kid, right? So I thought, you know what? I'm going to do a somersault. And I was like, you know what? I'm not even sure I remember how to do one. And I had to think about it, and I was kind of scared because it's like I haven't, like, tumbled like that in a long time. And I'm like, I kind of forgot what the feeling was like. And so, but I pushed myself to do it. Anyways, I (laughs) ended up filming uh, a little video of me doing three somersaults in a row. And, you know, three somersaults in a row when you haven't done it in a while, it gets to be a little, I was a little loopy (laughs) afterwards. It's like, whoa, man, what was I doing? But it was such a great experience, and it was so fun to remember that feeling like when you're a kid and you know even in high school remember I remember I, I was trying to I used to do front handsprings uh, because I played soccer and I was trying to learn how to do a throw-in that was a front handspring throw-in right where you where you actually take the ball 
and you run up and then place the ball on the ground. You flip over and the ball is still in your hands. And when you come up, you snap your body and the ball will, you know, you'll be able to have a, a much larger or much farther throw in. I never quite got the, the, the throw in part. I tried it a few times and almost like, <laughs> you know, cracked a rib or whatever, trying to figure out how to do the actual throw in. But I got good at the front handspring anyways. But I hadn't done that in a while. I haven't, and I haven't tried that again because I'm, I'm afraid to, you know, whatever sprain my wrist now <laughs> these days. But at least I did the somersaults. Anyways, I filmed it and I, I put the video on the Facebook page. So, facebook.com forward slash Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. If you want to go search for it there, um, and it was just a funny thing. I just thought I'd challenge other people to try to do their own somersaults if you haven't tried one in a while. It's pretty fun, and it immediately throws you back into that. Uh, playful state and I don't know it might be an interesting thing for you to try to again kind of break up your patterns and it might uh, give you a different outlook on life that day <laughs> so which it did for me anyways hey let me take a second to welcome any new listeners that are out there and say thank you to the regular listeners out there of the podcast I just wanted to remind everybody that if you're getting something out of the podcast you're really enjoying it don't keep it to yourself share it with someone and I know that they will love you for it and of course, I will love you for it. And I know you know, I know you have someone in your life that needs to rediscover their play, especially these days. So <laughs> please share it with them. I know you're going to love this episode. And I know that after you listen, you'll be doing your own somersaults at home. I just know it. So here we go. This episode of Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution is brought to you by MGS Graphics a graphics production support firm delivering services to ad agencies, graphic designers, brand managers, retailers, and product manufacturers worldwide. MGS Graphics is not only reinventing, they are revolutionizing graphics production support. So how do they do it? Well, they free up your team to focus on big ideas while MGS Graphics handles the execution. Their skilled experts are ready to jump in when your project load spikes so you can avoid the headaches and extra overhead cost of hiring new staff. Plus, you won't lose out on work opportunities because of delivery and production timelines. Did you know their skilled staff of professionals use the best and most widely used graphics software on the market? And when it comes to project management, MGS Graphics provides the highest level of customer service by assigning you a dedicated project manager. And they use the industry-leading project management software to ensure all communication, deadlines, and deliverables are met. This allows teams and clients to collaborate with each other in real time, no matter where you are around the world. Need more than just production? MGS Graphics also has a fully staffed creative team. Ask about their design services and agency partnerships. So, if you're looking for a partner to accelerate and support your business's growth, Go to mgsgraphicspro.com forward slash JJRR for 15% off your first project. 15%? That is revolutionary. Go to mgsgraphicspro.com forward slash JJRR. That's mgsgraphicspro.com forward slash JJRR. Welcome to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast, the show that explores reinvention in the digital age as it relates to career, creativity, and technology. Stay tuned for interviews with professionals, entrepreneurs, and creatives that have reimagined success and are making a pivot. If you'd like to listen to the entire back catalog, visit Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution.com for instant access. And now, here's your host, Jim Jim. Hey everybody, hey, this is Jim Jim, welcome to episode 75 of Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast, and I'm talking today with Jeff Harry, and we're talking about rediscovering your play. So Jeff, welcome to the Reinvention Revolution. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Uh, well, thanks for being on. You know, I am super stoked right now because you are wearing your bow tie, and <laughs> and I, I like I, we were talking earlier before, I was like... I wonder if Jeff's going to wear his bow tie because that's like his thing. And, you know, I, you know, I just record audio podcasts. So, but Jeff, I really, I think that's hip of you, man, to like, you know, get dressed up and, and throw on the bow tie for this conversation. So, yeah. Yeah. So just for your listeners, I'm wearing a Lego bow tie. Um, I got it from (laughs) a former educational company that I worked for, but I, I wore it on a dare for the, one of the first times I ever went to 
you know, like a, like a really serious conference. Oh, okay. Because I realized all the, all the other conferences I've been going to, everyone was dressed up, you know, in their professional wear and acting all serious and be like, I'm a serious adult. And look at me and look at all the, so I was like, <laughs> everyone's wearing a costume. So why not I wear a costume? I'm going to wear a costume. My costume is going to be this Lego bow tie. Right. And what was crazy was I had such a better experience when I wore it Uh because it gave permission for other people to nerd out with me and tell me about like their Lego experience or Game of Thrones or whatever nerdy thing they wanted to talk about because they were like, I don't need to be serious around this guy. This guy has a Lego bow tie on, for goodness sakes. (laughs) Right. Well, how did you... What's the genesis or the origin of the, of the Lego bow tie or bow tie of your thing? Like, have you were you just always into bow ties as a kid or something? Or no, oh, no, actually, no, <laughs> not, not at all. It was um, so the former um, educational company that I worked for. We taught kids engineering through Lego, I see. and we just started making these bow ties and giving them away to people that mm-hmm. we found that were super nerdy. And then we gave away a thousand in like five years and we got it on every continent, even Antarctica. Really? So, okay. Yeah. So it was like we would ca- – I would carry like seven of them around with me in a conference. And when I met somebody that like was super nerdy or vibed or was like, I need that bow tie, we would just hand it to them. They'd be like, what? Do you need something? you need some money or anything? And I was like, no, dude. Or <laughs> – or this is something that's interesting um, for your listeners is like, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, when you pass out business cards to people, people never respond. I would tell people, if you email me, I will mail you a bow tie because oh, we've given away a thousand of I these. Love that. Here's my business card. And out of the every time out of a hundred business cards that I would probably give out, maybe five to 10 people would email me, right. even though I'm offering something for free. So it's just so interesting how people are like, Ugh, I don't know if I want to play. This person's might be scary. Um, <laughs> right. But the people that are willing to take the risk, then get something really cool for free that they can wear for the rest of their life. Yeah. Well, I think it's a great idea. It's a great icebreaker and it really fits the the whole concept of, you know, rediscovering play and, you know, can you can you mention what that means to people? Co- because I, I, I really this quote, I was kind of checking out your your content and where you're coming from. And this quote is really kind of stuck, stuck, has stuck with me. And it's your future is where your fun is. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, right now during these times, especially of COVID, but also how the world is kind of, you know, really changing around and, the, and how the world's reinventing itself. We have to figure out how we're going to exist in this world going forward. So explain to people what rediscovering your play means yeah yeah so first I'll, let me identify that your future is where your fun is so okay. i learned that from um a play mentor of mine who doesn't even know him you know i i just follow him all the time but um his name's <laughs> kevin carroll okay um, wait a second he, i think that's the coolest term i've heard in a long time is to have a play mentor yeah <laughs> i don't have a play mentor do i need one maybe we should all get one and maybe jeff should be the guy play <laughs> you know and there's and so and some of these I have a few play mentors and some of these play mentors know who I am I and some idea. of them oh don't. God. Right. That's hilarious. So Kevin Carroll, I I've only met him once, but he he wrote the book The Red Rubber Ball, and he was the creative catalyst for Nike for like decade, like oh, a decade or a, a really long time. I, and before that he was the assistant basketball coach for uh the 76ers. And I'll just briefly say something that's so awesome about him is like, you know, this dude said like a red rubber ball saved his life. And that's like how he got into basketball and everything. Hmm. And then he went to the army and he learned Yugoslavian. So when the Yugoslavian team came in 1996, he's like this black dude that knew Yugoslavian. And one one, one day when he was – the 76ers were playing – Vlade Divac and the Sacramento Kings, Mm -hmm. he, um, the coach told him to start talking trash to Vlade in Yugoslavian because (laughs) Vlade was crushing him. He was just like, he was lighting him up. So he starts talking trash to him in Yugoslavian. And then Vlade has like a horrible third and fourth quarter. And then after the game, Vlade runs up to Kevin and Kevin's like, oh, I think he's going to like, you know, attack me or something like that. And Vlade goes, hey, how do you how do you learn all that? Um, can you be the translator for our team for the Olympics? 
So oh, he was the translator wow. for the Yugoslavian team that was playing like, you know, uh, the dream team in 96. So it's oh, like, wow. so it was just like this crazy, but this guy, it was all about play. And he talked about, and I forgot what the book was, but he talked about how what's powerful about the quote of your futures where your fun is, is whichever organizations or people are having the most fun, mm -hmm. they're the most adaptable. They're the most resilient. Uh -huh. They're the most willing to take risks. Meanwhile, like a curmudgeon of an organization, like a blockbuster, like a Toys R Us, mm -hmm. where they're scared to take a risk, where they're like, well, Netflix is never going to take us over because we have play we have locations all over the world. And right. why would anyone want to get DVDs via mail? That's so stupid. You <laughs> right. know, like we're doing great. Why know, did we explore? Like we're, doing, we're doing great the way we are, and there's no need for us to change. Right. But for people that are willing to like dive into that future, that is where um you can not only survive but actually thrive. Right. As for rediscover your play, I created it as a way of combining positive psychology and play to help a lot of businesses tackle like some of their most challenging pain points and issues like mm -hmm. how to deal with toxicity at work how to deal with office politics like the meeting before the meeting and the meeting after the meeting how much money is that costing you right, right. how much money is it costing you when a toxic person is there because you know, all these people leave because of that person. How do you create an inclusive work environment where you're like able to talk about race and class and all these things without offending people? How do you deal with inner critic work? How do you get your staff in a state of flow so they're doing their best work and they actually believe that you care about them and not just their output? Right. So right. I created that just to tackle this because I realized that a lot of companies claim that they're playing but they're not at all <laughs> <laughs> right well that's the i think that's the corporate way in a way so like i was you know i spent many years in the corporate world uh and i was in the advanced technology part of it which allowed me to continue to play kind of looking back on that now right because that was just my uh, my outlook on life i was always even though I, I studied engineering and physics, I was always more in the creative zone in my mind. And I, I, I always played music and musician. And uh, I never thought of myself as that super creative, but I guess I was always really. <laughs> yep. Uh, but it's just how people yep. look at you and, and judge you, you know, especially in the corporate world about, oh, you're an engineer, or whatever, you're not that creative. Uh, but that's what, we, that's what my job was, was inventing, basically, um, you know, inventing new technologies. And I would always have fun at work and I thought it would be awkward when other people weren't having fun because, you know, they were more like people that were into the organization or into the structure or into that. And they, I'm not sure they understood the value of it and, and the, the, uh, the opportunity, the opportunity that they were missing. And, and that's, right. that's, that's the thing that, you know, that I think everybody listening can really connect to and that you've really figured out such an interesting way to bring to to the world and to bring to your clients and and other entrepreneurs out there is this connection can you explain a little bit more about maybe the the psychology behind it or why like yeah. why it works or why why this yeah. should be a thing and and maybe why we've as adults you forget it like why why right. do we get why do we lose touch with it so yeah so I'll dive into all of that um first off we have to understand that we are at work if you're working 50 hours a week and you're working 50 weeks out of the year, that is 2,500 hours. Mm -hmm. And we only have like, I think, 8,670 hours in a given year. That's right, yeah. 24, you know, you know, total. So if you're going to be at work for like <laughs> almost a, like a, almost going on a third, I mean, like between a third and a fourth of the time, why wouldn't you focus on having a little bit more fun while you're doing it? Right. 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 Like, what are we doing? Like if we're, you know, um, so then let's talk about some of the brain science behind it. When you're in a state of play, when you're in a state of flow, what happens actually is. Typically, your your brain or your prefrontal cortex is in a in a beta state, right? And that's you know it's protecting you. It's it's um, you know that's where your subconscious is. 
Um, that's where your inner critic is. You know, that's where your negativity bias is because it's protecting you from all of those like dangers from like our lizard brain from when, you know, right. the tiger would attack. Right. Mm -hmm. But what happens when you go into a state of flow, when you go from beta to flow, a uh, flow state is your prefrontal cortex or a part of it is actually shutting down and you're going through something called transient hypnofrontality. And what is happening is your brain starts to distort time. That's why you like forget about time when you're in a state of flow. Mm -hmm. And then also your inner critic starts to dissipate. So that mean voice that's always saying to you what you shouldn't do starts to go away. And then your implicit mind starts to bubble up and you become highly creative. And then you get this shot of dopamine and you become highly curious. And when you're in this flow state, you're all of a sudden able to see all these opportunities that you didn't see before. And what adults do a lot is they get fixated on one result and then they get really depressed if they don't get to that result. And I always say expectations are the thief of joy. And like that is what happens in that state. But when you're in a, fl a flow state, as Dr. Chikset Mihai, you know, the doctor of flow for positive psychology would always say, is your skill level is meeting the challenge perfectly. Like, mm. and what I mean by that is, is he has this flow chart of all things where when your skill level is low and you're and the challenge is really hard. You have a lot of anxiety. That happens when you first start a job or any right. like new thing. Like when you start your podcast, you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. Exactly. Right. <laughs> and then later on, when your skill level is really high, but the, the challenge isn't, then you get bored. You know, you get bored at work. You get bored like, mm -hmm. you know, binge watching Netflix. Like it's just not fun. But between anxiety and boredom is that flow state. So – that's it's challenging you on all these different levels, intellectually, creatively, like, you know, spiritually, just all this stuff. And you feel like most alive. Mm -hmm. Right. And and the way I define play is any joyful act where you're fully present in the moment, where it's purposeless, where you're letting go of results, where you don't have anxiety about the future or um, regrets about the past. And mm -hmm. you're just like in it. And you don't want to be anywhere else. And we've all experienced that. So so my challenge to people is just like, why not look for, as Gay Hendricks refers to it, is your zone of genius work or your red thread work, as Marcus Buckingham says, you know, and focus more on increasing that. Because if you're able to increase that flow state just a little bit more at your job, it has a ripple effect on all of your other work. Right. In a positive way. Oh, abs absolutely. Well, whew, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot you just dropped on everybody right there. Um, but yeah, I, whew, wow. Um, I, I've kind of known this inherently, gosh, from just from a young age, just because I played music, I can always feel like a flow state when I was playing music, uh -huh. for example. And, and not all the time. Like, you notice the differences where it's like, you know, you're playing and you have like a, you're having like a great gig and it's just like, Man, that was a three-hour gig. It it feels like we just started ten minutes ago. Exactly right. Like you have exactly. those experiences, or even in sports where it's like, I mean, I think people even describe it like when you know when someone's just you know can't miss the basket. Like oh, he's unconscious. I mean, he's yeah, he's, it's he's he's in the zone. He's in the zone. That's what it's actually the an accurate description, right? Yeah, and look at what they say in the interview afterwards because you're like. You know, what did the basket look like? Oh, it was huge. What was it like? Everything was in slow motion, right? Distorting right. time. Right. You know, oh, did you know how much you had scored? Actually, I didn't. I didn't actually care about the result. Right. I was not looking at the score because I was fully in the moment. And a question I have for you is, were, were there times where you would play music and then that flow of you being in music then also then affect how you, you know, tackled like an engineering problem was like, was, did you feel some connect with it? Because, uh, well, you know, that's a, well, that's a good question. I, I don't know if the flow state, um, necessarily affected it, but I have thought over the years and, and actually observed over the years that I do approach things a little bit differently and I'm able to connect things in a better, clearer way than other types of engineers. Like some engineers are super left-brained, super mm -hmm. brilliant. I mean, really brilliant, whatever. But oftentimes they miss the connections of 
how to actually sort of, you know, get out of that paper bag. Like if you, if you right. point them in this direction and it's a super hard problem, they can, they can use their massive brain power to solve it. But knowing the right direction is difficult for them. It's like, it's, it's, right. it's a little bit hard to describe where it's, a li- that's a little bit easier for me. So it's, that's interesting because you know, I feel like what you've done by simply playing music and then also doing this other work, right, is you're finding some like synergy between your left brain and right brain. Right. And you're doing it all by playing. And when you were playing music, you weren't thinking like, I'm going to play music so that I'll be better at engineering. Right. You were just doing it because it was fun. But look at the benefits it has on all the other work and creative outlets that you explore oh certainly yeah i mean i i I mean i i keep realizing it about myself like every day now like you know for a while i would i I would get frustrated thinking like why can't they see this it's so obvious the solution is so obvious we need to go this direction or we need to put these three things together and a lot of you know my colleagues would not be able to see it then it's like you know weeks later and arguing and then you know they finally come to the resolution it's like why is this so clear to me and not clear to them? And, and these yeah. are people that I really respect and are super, super brilliant. I mean, it's kind of just, you just understand it's like, oh, this is sort of a, it's just sort of a vision thing or a personality thing. It's just like you realize there's something going on there that's a little bit different. But well, and, and then, and then the other question that you had was like, what happened? What happened to adults? Why don't we play them? <laughs> right, exactly. Right? So, like, so diving into that, I mean, first off, there was a moment when you left the playground as a kid, and then you never went back. And it's so sad, you know, like, that's just like, <laughs> oh, what was that? And you didn't even know that was going to be your last time at the playground, right? And this well, is why right, I exactly, some, yeah. You know, and I encourage some people, go back to the playground, go on a swing set sometime. But, you know, but the bigger thing, and I think we have to have a lot of compassion for ourselves as to why we don't play enough or why we don't embrace our weird, nerdy self enough. And the easiest way of answering this is um, 148,000 no's. Um, there was a study oh, really? done okay. by this, <laughs> this study done by this uh, professor um, who found that by the time you're 18, you have heard the word no at least 148,000 times. Mm, okay. So then, on top of her, that, of you hearing no so much and hearing yes, very few, like under 10,000, right? right? Then, you know, you grow up your whole life where people are shitting on you all the time. You should do this. You should do that. You should major in this. This is the job you should do. So you're getting shit on by your parents. You're getting shit on by all these adults. And then you go to school where you're told to raise your hand all the time. You're told to ask permission all the time, Mm -hmm. you know. And then when you're not in school, you get social media as well as just regular media that's telling you you're not enough. And then anytime you try to be yourself, you're told you're mischievous you're told you're being too much you're told you're too weird like oh you're like said all so it's such a revolutionary act (laughs) to embrace your weird right it's such a rebellious act to be like yeah i'm gonna ignore all of the societal norms that are telling me to be normal which is so boring by the way and no one that i've met ever really enjoys normal you know, and just be you, like just embrace your nerdy you to do something simply because you want to do it, you know, and I commend anyone that is willing to do that. Like you starting your podcast or me making videos or someone that writes a blog post or, you know, like just puts themselves out there in a, in a, in a way that is vulnerable, but also is like, Hey, look, I'm weird and I don't care. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I like that. And you know what? I think that's, I've, I got uh, over the years, I got a lot of that from playing music because when Mm -hmm. you play music, you're allowed, you're always around a lot of weird characters or people that are more willing to embrace their weirdness, I would say. Right. Right. You know, a lot of musicians can be super nerdy and, and what, and weird and funky and dress, you dress a little bit strangely, you know, not of the mainstream. And I I always lived like it, like I've always lived like two or three different lives, you know, my engineering corporate life, my music life and, and, you know, my sports life or whatever. I mean, I always kind of, I enjoy kind of going between all these different groups, but now I realize kind of the value that it gave me. It still gives me yeah. um, in order to like kind of changing speeds or changing lanes all the time. Keeps that creative, the creative juices flowing. Keep, keeps me feeling younger in a way or something, you know? 
No, totally. Just because, um, you know, I used to hang out with a lot of stand up comedians and they like are just like, I'm not growing up. Right. Like, <laughs> like their whole goal right. is to call BS on normal stuff and being like, that's stupid. You know, so I like it's great <laughs> right. when you hang out in these different worlds that are challenging the status quo, because, you know, when I I've talked to people you know, or, or certain clients and they're like, yeah, I'm struggling. And I'm like, wait a minute, who are you trying to impress right now? Like, I love to ask that question because I'm like, if you're trying to impress somebody that you won't care about in a year, kind of like when you were in high school and you were trying to impress the, you know, the cool kids, you're right. like, why am I doing that? Like anyone that you're trying to impress should be your loved ones, but your loved ones love you anyway. So they don't need to be impressed. So the only person you should be trying to impress is yourself, right? <laughs> right. You know, it's like, you know, you, you, so, so, and I think such, so much of the keeping up with the Joneses and being like, oh, what is this person doing? Or what kind of car are they driving? Or, oh, they got a promotion. So I got to get a promotion. Right. Like that rat race is just so dull, you know, and then having boring conversations like, what do you do for work? You know, what is your job? Like, <laughs> like that's not even, it doesn't even express who you are. Right. 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 You know, why are we asking such mundane questions? The questions I love to ask people, especially when I'm at conferences, I'm like, you know, what mischief are you causing? You know, what trouble have you caused recently? And they're like, excuse me. And then I'm <laughs> like, yeah, man, like, you know, what, you know, what kind of tables have you been flipping? And then someone will be like, actually, you want me to tell you what I do? <laughs> you know, or like, <laughs> what's your, what's the nerdiest thing about you? Right. I want to know that. Right. I care more about that than whether or you're an accountant or not, or especially if you don't even like your job. Right. Because like, I was going to say your job could actually, be just a random consequence of just, yeah. oh, whatever, you know, I just ended up there and, but it's not right. really who they are, you know? Yeah. So then you're like talking about like, what do you do for a living? What the weather is? Just all these boring conversations that none of us want to have. Let's actually have a real conversation about how weird and nerdy we all are. <laughs> Right. I love it. Well, okay. So you said something when you were talking about kind of keeping up with the Joneses that I wanted to go back to and, and ask you about a little nuance of play because I've, I've run into these characters, especially in the corporate world, uh, not so much in the ent entrepreneurship world because they're people are more in touch, I think with their passions and, you know, and their interests and stuff there. But uh, like the idea of play sometimes uh, for people, uh, carries with it this idea of competition or competitiveness. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, let's play a game. And the the instead of taking those expectations and putting them to the side and really actually getting into play, they're only looking at it in the context on in the context of this is an opportunity for me to show you that I'm better than you or for exactly. me to beat you or whatever. So like, how do you uh, how do you think about that or how do you disarm people in terms I, of I actually at least my definition doesn't fit that, okay. right? Because again, I'm like any joyful act where you're fully present in the moment, where you let go of the result. Right? right, exactly. And if you're playing basketball and you're like diving on the floor because you're like, I got to win this intramural game, you know, <laughs> right. you know, and you're just like, why you play? You are like way too into this game right now. And like your ego is like, connected to the outcome of this game right then i don't know i don't think you're playing i don't think you're playing in the truest sense of play because you're because your value you're measuring based off of the result right right you know it's the same way in which you know my friend angie cole taught me about how a lot of people attach their self-worth to their productivity or their self-worth mm -hmm. to their net worth. Like how much money do they have in the bank? Right. And it's just like, well, how's that working out for you? Because what happened when 2020 happened and you, everyone was in quarantine and you couldn't produce at the same rate, right. you know, are you not as valuable as much anymore? Mm -hmm. Like, let's challenge that notion. Oh, you don't have, you know, four, four million dollars in, in your bank account. Are you not valuable now? Like, is everyone else? <laughs> that has that better than you? Like, is that really what we're, you're talking about? Um, and then it, it kind of ties in with a term I coined called affluent uh, deadness. You know, yeah. I, I know a lot of people that are affluent. I know a lot of people that have a lot of money, mm -hmm. you know, many millionaires, people that can travel the world 10 times over, they can buy whatever they want anytime they want. Right. And, 
for not everyone, but there's a surprising majority of people that I meet that are, are quite affluent in that way that have deadness in their eye. <laughs> and when you look at it, you're like, are you not having fun? Like you, sh if anyone should be having fun, it should be you, right? right? You right. have it all. And what I instead notice them have, they either have paranoia because they think they're going to lose all their money mm -hmm. or they have jealousy because they don't have as much money as somebody else. They may have, they might have a net worth of 5 million, but someone has a net worth of 5.5 .5 million, right. right? Or whatever BS that is. Or the worst is they look bored. Like they thought they would be happy when they got everything mm -hmm. and they're not happy. And then what's the craziest part is I know some of them that have been post on Instagram being like, look how amazing my life is. And, you know, I'm the best. And it's just like, <laughs> you're not happy. Like as soon as you hop off, I know who you are right. behind the scenes, you know. And it's just like, why are you selling this story that when you get to this echelon, that is when – You'll be fulfilled, happy, joyful. And then why do so many of us buy into that or like striving to get there to this rich affluency only to be disappointed when we get, get to that place, right? Right, right? And instead, I challenge people to be like, you know, how can you be affluent in a social context, like have deeper connections? You know, um, positive psychology analyzes that the, the people that consider their life the most worth living that that say they had such an amazing life mm -hmm. have many deep connections or or a few strong connections like that is what made their life worth living right. and when you look at top five regrets of people that are dying one of them is i work too much and then the second one was i tried to people please and i tried to impress so many people that i really didn't care about right so like Let's learn from the dying and not make the same mistake and actually be fully present and enjoy what you have right in front of you. Well, you know, I it's, that's funny because what would you say, your aff affluent deadness? Yeah. I, I've thought about this many times and, and, you know, I've experienced that with a lot of the uh, characters I would have run into, you know, in my, uh, you know, corporate days when I was working for much bigger companies uh, and not on my own. And I, and I kind of always thought about like, is that like... Because in order to kind of exist in that world, you kind of have to go to their cocktail parties and go to, yeah. the, to the Christmas holiday parties. And, and it's like, these aren't the people I want to hang out with because it's not fun. It's not fun. There was no fun. Like, there was no joy sort those of there. The worst, they all were kind of doing it. Those are the worst it. parties. Those are the worst parties. Right. How can you have so much money and run such boring parties? Right. It's because <laughs> right. everyone is trying to not... Um, you know, make a mistake or not look stupid. Right. And it's just like, dude, this is just so ridiculous, right? It's just like loosen up, man. <laughs> and if you're not going to loosen up, then give some of that money away because I know a lot of people that would have a lot of fun Absolutely. with all that money that you are squandering trying to impress each other with. Right. Yeah. I, you know, I always think about, I say this to some of my buddies sometimes. It's like, because I've been in all these environments, like super affluent environments and just regular, just, musician jams where it's like all these people have no money but they're having the best time and the best life mm -hmm. really and, and i always say like you know sometimes when the money shows the fun goes down yeah so it's sort of like you know when you're when like when a certain club becomes popular and all of a sudden it's like the red velvet ropes go up and they start charging yeah. 20 bucks to get in the fun goes down now yeah. now that appeals yeah. to some people because they want to be seen they think it's going to work for them or whatever but the actual authentic connection and fun of the environment goes down and i can't explain well, why you, but it does well, if, you th if you think about it is because what happens is all of a sudden your ego takes over right and then it's all about impressing others and the and the reality is is you're never going to get enough likes to be loved you're never going to get enough followers to be loved you're never going to get enough no money to feel like loved and fill that void that you have right and i even think of like my family in the philippines i have family in manila um, and I have family in San Arciso, this tiny village where they sleep on dirt floors. And I like hanging out more with my family in San Arciso because even though they have no money, like right. none, right. they are living in shacks. They are having the time of their life because they're <laughs> like, what? At, like, like I want to be present right now. There right. might be a flood tomorrow and it might, you know, wash away our entire village. 
I'm going to enjoy life at this very moment in time. And the and the the chat the 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 lesson to be learned there is if you can't enjoy where you're at right now with what you do have, you're not going to enjoy when you have more. Right. And and uh, happiness uh, studies have found that if you're already making seventy five thousand dollars a year, below that is different. But if you're making seventy five thousand dollars a year, or you're making a million dollars a year, happiness levels are exactly the same. Right. The exact same. Right. So, why are we trying to earn more money if it's not bringing us the happiness we're looking for? Right. Well, you know, I think this this touches on um, this one question that I, I noticed or the uh, kind of quote that you had on your website. And uh, or question that you were asking everybody, and that is, what what did you give up? What was the core part of you that you gave up because you had to become an adult? Like, if, I feel like we we yeah, I know this is a heavy question. Sorry, sorry, people, if you're listening out there, we're gonna go a little deep right now. But <laughs> Let's go. I, I, this Let's really go. spoke to me. Let's and, go. And I was like, oh my god, like Jeff is like, whoa, that's that's like really insightful, like core uh, stretching or whatever kind of thought process here, but. Yeah, what it what is the core part, or or what does that mean? Like, and this is something I think people don't want to, I guess, recognize or dig into because it could be painful and and you know serious. Well, but I, well, I mean, you know, diving into the pain of it, I, I'll I'll share a painful story. <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay, you know, like I'll, I'll, I'll share the uh, it's, you know I'll share the five minute version of this story. Like I considered this like one of my most embarrassing stories when I was a teenager, right? So so I remember it was seventh grade and. Um, all of a sudden, no one wanted to play anymore. Everyone wanted to be cool. Remember that? Like, it was right. just like there was a vote, and like <laughs> they had voted who were the cool kids and who were not. Right. And I didn't get a mail in ballot. So I was like super pissed off because I didn't get, right. I didn't get a say. And I remember like asking my friends, like, okay, well, what do I need to do to get like to belong, basically? Mm -hmm. And I'm this black. Asian dude, this black Caribbean Filipino dude in this predominantly white suburb of Chicago. Um, and I remember, you know, one of my friends being like, yo, if you, you want to get girls, you want to date, you're going to have to get bangs. And I was like, what? And he's like, bangs, you know, the bangs that are hang over your eyes. And I'm like, I have a fro. Like I have right. a like That's not happening. microphone, <laughs> dude. Like, what are you talking about? And and they were like, well, that's what they have. So I remember stealing my sister's Vidal Sassoon mousse oh and pouring so much of it in my hair that I would shove it down and make a frozen bang that would cover my eye, right? <laughs> this is a lot of information, but, Jeff. Wow. That's a lot of information. Right? <laughs> this is a lot, great. right? But then what happened was by fifth period, the moose would dry up because right. that's what happens with moose. Right. And it would turn from a bang into like a raccoon's butt that's like coming out of my forehead as I'm talking to ladies. And I was like, hello, ladies. <laughs> and they'd be like, oh, grouse. You're so hey, grouse. No, no. Right? <laughs> so like I'm trying to gain all this acceptance. And then I remember it was like the party of the year. It was like this pool party. It was really big. Mm -hmm. And anyone that any, anyone was going to be there, right? Um, and But it was invite only. So I remember begging Antonio and Joey Villa Gomez if I could go with them. And at first they were like, I don't know. But then like I think I bought them lunch and passed notes for them. Or I did whatever I could to like gain acceptance, right? To belong. Right. Um, and then the night of the party, I'm like actually going. Like I'm in the car with them. I'm like singing. I'm like, I'm going to the pool party, going to the pool party. Like I am amped, dude, right? Right. You know, I got my Z Cavarici shorts on. Oh, you know, goodness. I poured Jacquard Noir all over my body, which is so <laughs> gross. You know, and right. then I remember getting out of the car, and this was 20 feet before the entrance. Mm -hmm. Um, and we are like doing that 90210 walk, right. like, you know, with a towel over, throwing the towel over. Just I'm just feeling so cool. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember I think it was like Ron and Brian and a bunch of people were in front of the party. And they were friends of mine and they weren't being led in the party. And I was like, oh, man, this is really exclusive. Right. And then I remember someone saying something to them because they got into a like, there started to be a scuffle, like right. pushing and shoving. Okay. And I'm 10 feet from the entrance. 
And then someone says to them, get the fuck out of here. We're not letting any niggers in this party. Oh, my goodness. Yikes. Yeah. And when they said that, I was like, uh, wh- like I just felt like this gut punch, man. Right, right. Because I was like, wait a minute. Like, I'm black. Like, I'm a nigger. Like, am I not going to be allowed in this party? And that's all I wanted. All I wanted to do was belong. Right. right? Yeah. So I remember getting there like five feet away. And I feel like, like water has filled up to my knees and just froze. And I just couldn't move. And Antonio looks at me. He's like, come on. It's no big deal. You know? And I'm like, it is a big deal, dude. Like, I'm not going to get let in. I don't even know how to get home from here. You know? And then I remember we get up to the front and they look at Antonio. They look at Joey. And then they look at me. And they're like, you know, is he black? And and then Antonio's like, no, he's Latino. And I remember just thinking like, don't say anything. Don't say anything. Don't say anything and you get in. Don't say anything and you get in. Right? Right. And then someone nonchalantly just goes, all right, and just nonchalantly. And it was, you know, for them it was nothing. But for me it was like everything. Like right. I finally was getting accepted. Right. And I first felt this like wave of relief as I walked into this pool party. And then I was thinking it would follow with all this, you know, joy and happiness. And instead I felt like I left all of myself out there. Mm. Like I felt like I abandoned myself out there. Right. And right. like there's 50 people at the party. Everyone's talking. It's like one of those cool parties, right? No one's in the pool. No one's playing. Right. Um, and I felt just such shame, dude, and such like a rejection of myself. And I remember going into the pool and just like sinking into the pool and, and being like feeling like that was the loneliest I had ever felt. Like mm. in my life up until that point. Right. And I remember making a pact with myself that day. Like I am not going to try to be cool and compromise who I am. So after that, I stopped trying to like wear all the clothes and the cologne. And I remember going into my basement, making up really stupid games and playing them by myself. And then some of my friends found out I was doing this and was just like, oh, this is one safe space where we also don't have to be cool, where we can just hang out. Right. And I started just doing that. And I do that now. <laughs> I still do that work now. I create right. safe spaces for people to be themselves. So so for me, I learned it really early on in that experience of like, that is what happens. You lose, you gain everything, meaning you gain the belonging and and the acceptance and everything, but right. you lose everything of who you are. I see. Oh, and that, I was like, I don't, I don't want people to do that or feel the need that they have to do that anymore. So what was, okay. So this is interesting because some people talking about losing a you know core part of themselves, some people have that experience and they are not strong enough. I'm not sure that's the right word, but they're not, you know, together enough at that time as a young person to say, to reject it, and they kind of live their life for the next 20, 30 years right. without that core part of them. And this mm-hmm. is why, why play can help you get back in touch with that core part. What was it about you that at that time you, you, you rejected that idea right away? You said, you know what? I'm not going this direction. I like where I'm at. I like who I'm going to be. Well, I think it was just because it was so painful. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, this is not fun. You know, at the end of the day, I just want to do things that are fun and enjoyable where I can – I like I build connection and rapport with people by playing. Right. I build trust by playing. So when I was sitting there, you know, at that party being like, no one cares that I'm here. I could leave. No one would care. Like, right. There's no play here. So why am I here? <laughs> right. You know, yeah. which is like, this is just not enjoyable. So, you know what? I, I think I would challenge a lot of your listeners um, and this is a really interesting process that people can do to figure out, again, where their play is or who they are. Mm-hmm. Um, I do this with a lot of my clients. I have them reach out to their three or four of their closest friends, you know, or, or colleagues, whoever you consider close. Maybe it's family members. Right. And have them ask um, them two questions. Uh, the first question is, what value do I bring to your life? Because I think a lot of us don't know the value we bring to other people. Like we don't even mm-hmm. know the impact. Right. Like, why are we friends? Like, what do I do for you? Right. Right. You know, so asking them, what value do I bring to your, to your life? And then the second question, this is a more interesting, playful question, but it's like, when have you seen me like most alive, mm. like most excited, like right. most joyful, 
like most playful, you know, like most present. Like when have you last seen me like that? Right. And it's interesting when you ask many people, like three to five different people, because they're all going to give you different answers. Mm -hmm. But when you write it all down and you look at the patterns that form, like, oh, these are the values I bring to people. Oh, these are the ways in which I, I'm most alive or been most, most present. Wow. How come I'm not doing more of that? I should just do more of that. That seems like, and just following right. that curiosity. And then you're able to like, again, rediscover something that you already knew existed. Like we have all the answers that we need. We don't need anyone to tell us the answers. Mm -hmm. We just need someone to remind us maybe once in a while of what our song is and have us play enough in order to rediscover who we are. Right, exactly. Yeah, you got to kind of just listen or look inside a little bit sometimes. Well, you know, wow, I love those two questions. I'm going to try that on myself, I think. Yeah. Um, because it's like, yeah, it's just, you know, the, the more I get into kind of redefining myself, reinventing myself, looking at the world, how it's, how it's being reinvented. It's just something that we have to continue to stay, stay on top of, I think, because you can get down these just ruts and channels that just really, and then life goes by too quickly then. And you sort of, you know, you're missing the opportunities and value and valuable things that you could be adding to the universe, you know? I, I agree. And, and the other part of it is like, you know, let's just break down reinvention, right? Like, how have you had to reinvent yourself in 2020? You know, there's yeah. a lot of people that had visions of what their 2020 was going to be. We all had, you know, dreams of like, I'm going to travel the world. I'm going to speak on all these stages. I'm going to get married. I'm going to, my life is going to change because it's 2020, right? Yep. That number. And then you had to let go of all that. Well, guess what? A lot of people didn't let that go. A lot of people are still disappointed. Mm. And and even in this workshop, I, the Future is Where Your Fund is workshop that I run with my f uh, friend Lauren Yi, we have an exercise where people literally write down what their expectations for 2020 were, what, mm. they, what they thought they what were going to do yeah. in 2020. And then we have them folded up into a paper airplane and let that stuff go, dude. <laughs> Because you, <laughs> really? have to, you have to let it go in order to make these last two months of 2020 something new, to right. reinvent what 2020 could be. Right. You know, there's a poem that says something like, you know, maybe 2020 is the year we're looking for, like, because there's so much disruption, right? It's really challenging. Do I like my job? Do I like how I, I, uh, how I show up in the world. Mm -hmm. What have I learned about myself during quarantine? What, who is actually important in my life? Right? Like, you know, you now have the challenge of like, should I go see that friend? Because I might risk getting infected. Okay. Maybe I'm not going to see that friend, right. you know? So you start prioritizing what's important in life. You know, we're surrounded by so much like, you know, death and despair, you know, fires, floods, all these things that are happening that you really have to be looking at, like, what is actually important? And if, you know, if I was to pass away in six months, what what impact why would I want to have? Right. How would I show up today? Would I binge watch Netflix today if I knew that I didn't have that much time left? You know, the, these are the reinvention questions that you can ask yourself and see what you come up with. Right. Well, I love it. And yeah, certainly 2020 has been a wake up call for, for everybody. So, <laughs> and I, I kind of pr appreciate it, honestly. I mean, it's, you know, the, there's struggles out there, certainly. And if you've been affected by COVID, you know, personally, that's, that's a tough thing to get through. But um, otherwise, I think there's some silver lining in terms of the wake up call for everyone. Well, look, before we get out of here, I, I wanted to kind of rewind a little bit and hear about kind of the the you know, your take on life and how you got into being a play mentor of yourself or for for all sure. of us right your own play mentor and how you how you developed this business because this is kind of a a crazy wild thing to kind of come out of your brain and imagine of like <laughs> hey I'm going to make money playing you know like right. and teaching people right. to play I mean how, how does that even happen I mean that that's kind of wild right no so I love that I'm sharing the story now at the end because usually I share it at the beginning but you know third grade man <laughs> I saw the I saw the movie big remember big with Tom oh, Hanks yeah. okay sure you know and he's dancing on a piano and then the CEO comes up to him and is like hey do you want a job uh, you know like in the toy <laughs> industry where you just get to play for with toys for a living and when i heard that i was like you get to play with toys 
for a living? <laughs> and I was, I just freaked out, dude. And I started writing toy companies in fifth grade. Oh, wow. Like man. I was on my word processor writing e um, letter after letter. And a lot of times I'd write these six page letters with all my ideas on it. Mm -hmm. And they get sent back because I didn't have enough postage on there. So then I started making six copies and sending them all. And I was spamming companies before spam was a thing, dude. Wow. Like okay. they, I think Old they school thought. Spam. <laughs> I think they thought um, I was an adult, right? right? Right. So what was so interesting was I, um, so I wrote all these toy companies that finally happened um, where I went to college and then I got into the toy industry mm -hmm. and it was so disappointing. Oh, like, you know, when wow. you get something and okay. you're like, I suppose uh, it's supposed to be I amazing. Th right. You know, there were no no toys, no high fives, no kids playing, no adults playing, no, like no fun. Right. I was in a cubicle and I remember I was in New York and like 9-11 happened and I was just like, what am I doing here? I don't want to die in a cubicle. Um, and, I remember <laughs> right. and I remember leaving, moving to the Bay Area, finding an organization that had seven nerdy dudes that was teaching kids engineering with Lego. Mm -hmm. And I hung out with them and we grew, we grew one of the largest Lego STEM education companies like in the country. Mm -hmm. Like – we went from seven people to 400 people. We taught 100,000 kids a year. We were just doing all this cool stuff, and we had no idea what we were doing. No <laughs> idea. We were just making it up as we went right. along. We were just playing. We would be like, hey, New York, is that a fun city to do? Sweet. Hey, Austin, fun city. Hey, Laramie, Wyoming, no, not fun. You know, like, <laughs> like, we were yeah. like, we would just mess. And we would meet all these other people that had no business plan, but were doing Kick ass businesses by just playing and figuring it out. Right? Oh, that's interesting. Okay, let me let me ask you a question about this because yeah. you were you were you got out of school, you went into the corporate world, it sounds like of corporate toy yeah. world or whatever. It wasn't so, you know, what is it what what you thought it would be. You get out, how did you know or how did you discover that you had this entrepreneurial tendency or entrepreneurial expertise or passion? Because this is kind of a is it what did you think it was more risky to kind of just go to Silicon Valley and find some small company well, to work was, for. When, and, and when I was with this organization, I was playing with Lego and they were paying me. I mean, and they were paying me very little at the time. They were paying me 150 bucks a week, right? Yeah. And I was just Gary. That's not a lot by, of money in Northern California. <laughs> no, that's not a lot of money at <laughs> all, dude. We always okay. like struggling at first. Right. But I was thinking the whole time, I am getting paid to play. I am going to oh, do you're whatever just so I into need. into it. Okay. However I need to make this happen, you know, like I remember like contacting like a hundred schools in the first right. like two days or three days because I was like, I'm going to make, and this was when STEM, this was 2004. So STEM wasn't even a thing yet. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we were running camps for all the nerdy kids that didn't have an outlet. There was no such thing right. as STEM or, or, or nerd camps or whatever, you know, however people wanted to describe it. Right. Um, so when we grew it into this huge thing and then like Lego started to pay attention to us and we started partnering with them and we were doing a, a tour with Lego and then Silicon Valley noticed us and they were like, hey, do you do team building events? And of course we were like, yes, of course we do. No, we don't. We don't know what we're doing, but we just say yes to everything. You know, that's right. how we do it. You know, it's <laughs> great. And then what would happen is like I then ran team building events for like the next like probably eight years with this organization and I was in the Facebooks, the Googles, the Adobe's, like, you know, all these different or Clorox, all these different organizations. And I noticed what I said earlier, it's just like, they have the posters up that talk about motivation, talk about taking risks, talking about creativity. Right. But, it, but they had not created the environment for any of that to come up. Right. Right. They had not addressed basic issues like, how do I have a hard conversation with someone that I'm having a challenge with, right? Like, how do I um, deal with my inner critic? How do I deal with, like, all the office gossip in a way because it's making everyone unproductive? Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, let me create Rediscover Your Play and help them tackle these pain points and have them actually practice how to have hard conversations. Because I think a lot of 
people at work nowadays don't get time to practice. You're constantly told that you have to produce and produce and produce. Right. And it's just like, I don't know how to practice. Can I practice being a manager? Can I practice having a hard conversation? Can I practice building relationships with people or practice networking? I don't know how to do all these things. I'm just expected to know. And we create this safe play environment where we put people through role-playing exercises where they get a lot of repetition doing it so that by the time the workshop's over, they're like, I can do this. I can go up to Chad and be like, Chad, you're super rude in in these meetings and you keep cutting off Samantha. What you're communicating to her and everyone else in this group is that you're, you don't want to listen to us. Is that your intent, Chad? And then – and they might be like, oh, I didn't even realize I was doing that. Sweet. And then now the problem solved. Right, right. So like that is what I'm trying to do with Rediscover okay. Your Play. Tackle those painful issues. Okay. So as I'm listening to you talk in terms of the kind of the developing business part or whatever, what I what I hear or what I heard you kind of what your real experience was, was that the outcome that you were not attached to the outcome. Just like you're, no. you're you were like basically playing this whole time in terms of developing yeah. your career, right? You're like yeah. Hey, you know what? I didn't like that. I like this over here. I want to get more into this. I'm just enthusiastic. I want to play. I wasn't. You weren't early on worried about the money in this. You were surviving, right? You yeah, had a I was certain just level like, of sustenance, like, but it, right. it allowed your creativity to flourish, right? Yeah, and, so I, like, and I've and I've said this to a lot of my clients and people that you know that that I find out that are recently unemployed or thinking about what they want to do next with their life, and I'm like. Give yourself a certain amount of time. Like, look at your finances and like right. how what can, based off of my finances, I can be creative for the next four to six months and figure out how I want to reinvent myself. Right, right, right. right? And and there was something for me, and I learned this at a winery of all places, <laughs> where I was I was at a winery and I'm talking to this wine guy and I'm like, you know, dude, I don't know anything about wine, and he's like. If you like it, keep drinking it. If you don't like it, stop drinking it. And it was just so simple. <laughs> and it's like, right. it's like that's there how I follow my curiosity. I do this job or I do or I explore this this entrepreneurial thing or whatever the thing I'm creating. Right. And when I don't like it anymore, I stop. Just like a kid when they're in a playground and they play tag and they're like, okay, I don't want to play tag anymore. Oh, what are you playing? Oh, hide and seek. Okay, I don't right. want to play that anymore. You know, like you just – you, they, like they're not stuck on like – on the outcome of like what's going to be next. And here's right. the challenge I put to your listeners is why are we planning our lives in a linear fashion? Right. Because if oh, you I look back at your life, nothing has been linear, none of it. So why are we now being like, if I do A, then I'll get B to get to C because it's not going to play that way. Right. It just never plays out that way. 2020 should have taught us that, us that to us if we haven't already learned. So instead I challenge people, you know, Get quiet, calm down, soothe yourself, get bored, stop, you know, binge watching Netflix for just an hour or two <laughs> right. or stop scrolling for social media just for an hour or two and allow yourself to like listen to that inner curiosity, that whisper and see where what it says to you because it's going to whisper something super cool like start this, start this podcast, you know. Right. Write this blog post. Reach out to that person you've always wanted to reach out to. You know, I remember once watching an Avengers movie and then the VP of creative services was on the scroll at the end. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to reach out to the person. And I did via LinkedIn that <laughs> night. And they got back to me. And I was like, this is so cool. It was right. just like an experiment to see if I could connect with somebody and maybe collaborate with them. Right, right. So it's not as hard as we make it out to be. And as like Will Smith said, after he jumped out of that helicopter to bungee jump, he's like, he's like, seriously, on the opposite side of fear is everything, everything that you've been looking for. Right. That's right. Well, awesome, man. Jeff, you know, You've just been sharing a lot of gold. I, I can't. <laughs> it's hard for me to absorb it all because it's like, oh, these are, these are things that I've been thinking and feeling. It's hard for me to ar articulate it so el eloquently as you did just now. Uh, but thank goodness uh, that I got connected with you because this is great. I think for everybody that's listening, awesome. And I think now that I, I should have mentioned it maybe earlier, but uh, I think everyone can figure out now why Jeff is in the top 100 influencers out there in the human resources uh, niche. So, you know, if you're out there thinking about um, 
that you need more play at your workplace or or in your organization or how to be more you know entrepreneurial or, or, or something as you go along in life think about Jeff but before we get out of here there's always a couple of questions I'd like to ask people when they come on and one is in terms of reinvention the way the world is flowing one is about technology so you're, you were talking mm. about connection being able to, to reach out like you found someone on LinkedIn or whatever I mean that's a new methodology that you know, we didn't have when we were growing up that you have to kind of embrace and, and understand the opportunity for. How are you thinking about technology or managing it, all of these things that we can do now, like podcasting? Yeah, I feel like like when the when the invention of the radio came out, people are like, oh, that's going to destroy humanity. And when the invention of TV came out, I was like, oh, that's going to destroy humanity. And now people are saying that with social media. I think social media, just like anything else, is a tool. Right? right. And you can wield it in a really bad way. You can wield it in a really good way. You know, if you hop on social media, here's a challenge for your listeners. If you hopped on social media and you reached out to some friends you haven't connected with in a while and you just told them how dope they are and how much you appreciate them and then you hopped off, it would be such a different experience for you on social media. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I think I think a lot of times we have to uh reinvent or relook at how we're looking at it. I was just coaching somebody that um, wants to travel. She wants to travel all over the world. Like that's what she does. She's been doing that. And all of a sudden COVID hit, she can't travel. But then she found by simply playing, we were like, well, what is it that you love to do? What is it about travel that you love? Oh, I love to talk to people from other countries. Oh, I love to connect um, and listen, to, learn about other cultures. Well, how can we do that? via zoom there's mm -hmm. nomadic network there's camp indie there's all these places now all of a sudden she's part of all these networks she's meeting all these people from around the world that she would have never met before and the cool part is she's finding all these people that are going to house her when she finally gets to travel again right, right so right. like awesome. it's again reinventing technology there's you know i don't know if you know what laughter yoga is but if you want to laugh there's laughter yoga sessions happening 24 hours a day somebody is always running a laughter yoga session so you can always find laughter in the world so that is where i would think you know people have to look at technology of like knowing what i what brings me joy and happiness and then being like how can i use technology to help me get there i see i like that take on it in terms of like starting with yourself first and then, and then looking out into the world of technology. I really like that. So, well, that leads, leads me to my, my last question for you. And that is, you know, you mentioned some things about your, your client there, about how she had to think about reinventing her world or reimagining how she can kind of get that same access to the, to the world and the cultures. What's been going on with your business? Because I know a lot of your business is speaking, traveling the world and interacting with these companies. Um, I guess what's, what's more, um, what do you feel more urgent about now in terms of your own reinvention or your own reimagination um well in many ways it it wasn't as much a reinvention for me but it was like ooh, could i pull off these like super connected workshops via zoom i don't know let's try it okay, like yeah. you know, it's just this, this curious nature of like you know i'm about to run a dealing with toxic people at work workshop for i think the department of homeland security in a couple hours okay i don't know how it's gonna go like it may be cool <laughs> I don't know. Like, this is part of the experiment, right? Of just being like, let's see what happens. Um, uh, so for me, it's more be, you know, if there's anything that I feel like I've had to reinvent myself and, and I love this, um, from Elizabeth Gilbert, um, is she says, um, uh, she's never seen anyone go through personal transformation that hasn't first gotten tired of their own BS, Right? <laughs> right. And, and there's like, <laughs> so I remember in March, I had not made a single video. Right. <laughs> and not I was much, like, I don't really. have time. Oh, it's so awkward. I have to look at myself on the camera, blah, blah, blah. And then I was just, and then COVID hit. It was just like, guess what? You have all the time in the world. Uh, you know, right. What are you going to do now? <laughs> And then I could only binge watch Netflix and avoid it for so long. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to make a video. And then I've probably now made like 
I don't know, 50, 60 videos, a bunch of TikTok videos. I learned a new way of playing that I didn't realize where like I make a really stupid TikTok video to start my day and then it positively primes the rest of my day. And Ah, I see the rest of the day like play because I start with play. It's kind of like you, you know, playing music to start your day and then, and then you see everything like music, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and it reminds me of, of what my friend Desiree, asks me where, you know, she asked this great question at the beginning of her day, whenever, whenever something good happens, um, she asks herself, how can it get any better than this? And she doesn't ask it with yearning, but with curiosity, how can it get any better than this? Right. Right. So like, you know, how can it get any better than this? Oh, you know, I got to hang out with my girlfriend to wake up. Uh, How can it get any better than this? We are now talking. Ooh, how can it get any better than this? Later on, I'm doing this for the Homeland Security. Oh, how can it get any better than this? Then I get to like brainstorm with my friend Lauren about this crazy video we're going to make for this organization. How can it get any better than this? So like stacking positive priming moments and you can change the rest of your day and potentially change the rest of your life by simply recognizing that and also recognizing that thoughts usually last between nine seconds and 90 seconds. So if you have a bad moment, you can let it go. You can let it go off into the wind or you can choose to ruminate. But if you choose, choose to be curious, choose to like embrace your nerdy self and who you are, choose to follow your inner curiosity and choose to play more. And you'll be so much happier that you made that choice. I see. Oh, well, dude, I love it, man. And, you know, I like the priming idea. I'm actually putting together a priming guide, which uh, I've never mentioned this before on the podcast, by the way. So whoever's listening today, (laughs) because of Jeff, gets to hear this. Uh, I'm working on it right now, trying to put together like some ways, simple ways to kind of prime yourself for reinvention. Because I think people think about trying to reinvent themselves or trying to change or trying to be happier or whatever. And intellectually, we know all these things, but that's not how you get started, right? You got to get back down to playing and changing the the way your your brain chemistry works and all those kind of things. So priming idea is awesome. So, well, Jeff, it was great having you on the podcast today. If people want to continue to play with you, <laughs> where would they go? Where, where would you send them? How would they get sure. in touch? So, so you can find me at rediscoveryourplay.com. Okay. Or you can find me at the handle Jeff Harry Plays, J-E-F-F-H-A-R-R-Y-P-L-A-Y-S. And I'm on like everything, TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Medium at that handle. And, you know, if you come to my website, I have a bunch of play resources that you can just like check out. And then, you know, reach out to me. Let's have like a 20 minute call and figure out how we can help you rediscover your play and do some dope stuff in the world. Right. I'm, I'm with you, man. I'm on the vibe. I'm on the wavelength. So thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you for listening to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. If you want to hear more, join our mailing list at Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution.com. See you next time. And remember, the revolution has just begun. So dig in, embrace the process of reinvention, and start realizing the success you've always dreamed of. Hey, revolutionaries, if you enjoyed today's episode and today's guest, let them know by commenting on their Facebook page, finding their Twitter handle or Instagram feed, and letting them know you heard them on Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. And tell them what you got out of the episode, what you really liked or how they inspired you. I know they would get a kick out of it and will help others find the same value that you found.